Hello, everyone, and welcome to another episode of the Idea to Value podcast. I'm your host, Nick Skillcorn, and I'm thrilled to have with me today Kaiser Yang. He is the co founder and managing partner of Platypus Labs and also author of the upcoming innovation book, Crack the Code. Kaiser, it's wonderful having you uh, here with us today. Yeah, thank you so much, Nick. I'm delighted to be here and be a part of your program. Welcome to the Idea to Value podcast, where in every episode we highlight the latest insights into creativity and innovation from experts around the world. I'm your host, Nick Skillicorn. I care about the evidence behind what makes ideas happen, and I've already helped thousands of people just like you through my unique insights into recent scientific findings of how creativity works. I also show you how to turbocharge innovation programs so they finally deliver on the value and ideas you've been struggling to execute. Get your free training on how creativity can be improved by registering now at www.ideatovalue.com. Now let's get on with today's episode. So Kaiser, for people who haven't heard about you or the work that you do, could you just give us a brief background as to where you got started and how you got to where you are now? Yeah, for sure. So my, my track's a little bit uh, different from the usual. I, I did start working for large global organizations, companies like United Technologies and Nortel. Uh, but then I've spent my last 30 or so years more in the startup track. I've helped build and scale a number of different tech startups, as well as starting my business, a uh, couple of businesses of my own. And uh, for me, through it all, there's just the one commonality has been this application of human creativity to creatively solve problems, to invent uh, new ideas, fresh perspective on how we went about and better served our customers and grew our business. Uh, so I think it's this amalgamation of you know large corporate experience with startup experience, starting my own businesses uh, that culminated into the launch of an innovation en enablement firm called Platypus Labs. And today I spend most of my time delivering thought leadership or helping organizations build a sustainable culture of innovation using human creativity to find new ways to tackle challenges or seize new opportunities. And that's what I'm very excited to speak with you about today. Anyone who knows me knows that I'm all about the creativity, but also how you actually bring creativity to people. Um, so, so let's start there. What do you think uh, is the reason why so many people find it really challenging to be creative? Yeah, I mean, we, we've come up through our research uh, with the seven primary inhibitors of creativity. And I know we won't have time to go through all of them today, but probably the biggest one of them all, the granddaddy, is the fear, right? The fear of failure, the fear of embarrassment, the fear of being judged by others, the fear of your idea not being good enough. And when we can work with organizations at first the individual level to give them the creative competence to overcome some of that fear and create a lot of productive, what we call aha moments, um, it, it's truly inspiring to see folks go from that state of fear to really that state of exploration and discovery. Uh, but we also work with leadership and organizations to create that safe environment where you can remove as much of that fear as possible. And it may be you know, rituals and rewards, or just creating a safe haven for people to submit and contribute ideas to drive performance and drive growth. Uh, but for us, fear is probably the greatest thing that we try to tackle, and it has to start there. Um, you know, the, the second one, which I spend a lot of my time on, we call it premature editing. And oftentimes when teams and leaders and organizations even have been entrenched in an industry for too long. You, you think you know your customer, you think you know how your supply chain works and how your customer experience should be. It's hard to see things in new or fresh ways. And that premature editing is when that left brain analytical side kind of takes over and squashes an idea before it has time to flourish. And you know we often like to say that your expertise, while it's valued in your industry and your career, it can oftentimes be the greatest enemy of innovation. Uh, where we just take ideas and we can't see things in a new way or we're unwilling to approach things with a new perspective because we, we, we have too much expertise in that particular industry. So the fear and the premature editing, those are probably the top two out of the seven inhibitors of creativity that we most often see in organizations. So let's talk about fear a little bit more, just because fear is a very personal feeling. Uh, you 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 can have groups that have uh, fear at the same time, but it's also quite generic and, and general as far as the description goes. What is the fear actually of when, uh, 
when, when we're talking about what's preventing people either putting forward their ideas or working on their ideas, what's, yeah. what's actually preventing them taking that next step? No, for sure. I think fear, you can see it kind of manifest itself in different organizations from a number of different perspectives. But for example, when you sit in a brainstorming session and the facilitator or the leader says, how do we solve this challenge? What usually happens is we share our safest or the most obvious ideas, right? The first, second, or third idea that comes to mind, and we stop there. And, and it's not so much the fear of coming up with something new or different, but it's more this fear of, you know, I'm not sure if this next idea is good enough, or, you know, my, my peers might laugh at me for doing something like that. Uh, so many of the techniques that we actually teach are more structured ideation strategies or creative problem solving strategies that give you the confidence, more of a, a scaffolding, if you will, that you put around a building to kind of harness your creativity and un unlock some of those ideas. So it provides you with a safe, confident environment to promote ideas and pitch new ideas and everybody isn't able to do that. Um, and, and for us, we, we see a lot of productivity that way. So rather than just saying, hey, how do we solve this problem and running a brainstorming session, using some proven techniques and methodologies to overcome that fear and help come up with really extraordinary solutions to challenges that might be vexing organizations that we work with. Absolutely. I think when, when I talk about fear uh, and you, you actually look at the research as to what's happening in someone's mind, as you said, it's not the fear of coming up with the idea itself. It's the fear of judgment if that mm -hmm. were to be overt or the fear of what might the impact be if you suggest something and it's tried and it doesn't work. How would that impact your standing in the team or your reputation? And uh, well, some of these, these uh, frameworks and scaffolding as you talk about it, uh, that can provide people with sometimes the permission to suggest things, knowing that even if it's not perfect, there's a, a process behind it to, to help it improve, even if it's not perfect at the beginning. That's right. I mean, it's, it is the permission, right? It's this common language or this methodology that everybody goes through where it's okay to throw out kind of the unorthodox or unusual or even weird ideas because that's part of that creative process or the tool that we're using. And uh, that, as you said, the, the permission it gives you to really throw out some wacky ideas that might create that one spark that leads to that great innovation idea. Uh, that's, that's what we try to do with many of these techniques. So who in your mind should be engaging in these creative activities or for, uh, sort of um, uh, improving their innovation and creative fundamentals? You mentioned at the beginning, some people think it's just for the research and development uh, team or just the graphic designers or marketing team or the CEO. Um, is, is there a usefulness in having specialists who are the ones doing the creative work and the innovation work or what's your view as to who should be involved? Yeah, I mean, for us, the research that we've done, it, it clearly indicates that we are all hardwired for creativity, right? We all have this tremendous capacity to be creative and think, as you say, many say outside of the box, but oftentimes that gets suppressed through our work environment, maybe our schooling environment, things of that nature. Um, but when, when everybody can find their creativity and approach their uh, challenges and opportunities in new, unique ways. I think that's where you find some great performance within organizations. So we believe that creativity is really everybody's role and responsibility. It's not something that's reserved for the ivory tower, the CEO and the R&D department, but rather it's accessible to all of us. But just like building a muscle or building endurance from a cardio perspective, your creativity should be viewed as, as a skill that needs to be developed and nurtured over time. And much like you might spend 20 hours going or 20 minutes a day going on a walk or doing a workout, um, you know, oftentimes we, we just expect our creativity to kind of flourish in a meeting, but it does take a little bit of preparation and a little bit of practice and frequency to build that skill set. Um, and we, we've seen it time and time again with the organizations that we work with. If you just have some tools and techniques available to you, uh, you can do some really amazing things with your creativity. Uh, and I assume some of these tools and techniques are what you talk about in your forthcoming book, aren't they? Yes, absolutely. So in the book, I do share eight uh, keys, as we call them, to unlock innovation within organizations. And I know many are familiar to you, Nick, but 
I mean, there's some things as simple as a technique we call the judo flip. Uh, when you and, it, and it's simply this, when you're tackling a problem or an opportunity, what would happen if you did the opposite, right? How do you judo flip an assumption, judo flip a threat, or judo flip any kind of challenge? And if you think about it, that oppositional nature has, has really fueled some of the greatest innovation since the start of time. And, and so we go through and share a number of different examples of the judo flip in action, but basically it's taking all the rules and assumptions of say your customer experience or your distribution infrastructure or your go-to-market strategy and systematically going through and identifying what the opposite is. Now, the opposite isn't always the innovation, it's just the opposite, but when you look down that list of opposites, you'll be amazed at how many ideas it may spark in terms of how you go about and solve some of the innovation challenges in front of you. Uh, let, let's let's find an example then. Uh, judo flip, obviously, people know it from sport, but uh, which company or individual uh, do you think is a really good case study of, of how they've uh, taken that? Yeah, well, the one story I tell about in my, my book is the specialized bike manufacturer. These guys started back in the 1970s in Northern California importing some bike accessories from Italy, but they've grown into one of the largest bike manufacturers in the world. And when they were looking to create the next generation concept bike, they literally broke every single rule, did the opposite to come up with this concept bike. And it, it's called the FUCI. So UCI is the governing body of uh, racing. And you know F is F the UCI. But they, yeah. Robert, the creative director, said he went through the rule book and one by one did the opposite. So, for example, in governed racing, both wheels need to be of the same size. Robert said, that's great. Let's make the back wheel bigger so it's easier for racers to maintain speeds at higher speeds. Or the rule book says there can't be any motorized assistance. He said, perfect. Let's do the opposite. Let's put a small engine in the crank to help with the initial acceleration. There is even a kickstand that includes a lithium battery. And one by one, if you look up the FUCI bicycle from Specialized, it's this beautiful concept bike that was all inspired by doing exactly the opposite of what they were supposed to do. So the, the judo flip uh, sounds like a useful technique. What, what other uh, fundamentals or techniques did you, uh, did you bring into the book? Yeah, there's a number of other ones in there. I know uh, in one of your blogs, there's something similar referenced, but one of my favorites is called the borrowed idea. And it's really looking outside of your industry to gain insights into what makes a business model, a product, a service experience successful and taking those insights and bringing it back to challenge your status quo in your industry. And again, like I said before, oftentimes we, we tend to develop blinders uh, when we know too much about our customer or know too much about our industry. And when we can systematically go and borrow ideas from outside of our industry, it can really drive some amazing results. You know, like one of my favorite quotes uh, back from Stephen Jobs was he, he said at one point that he was embarrassed to be called a creative because in his mind, creativity was nothing more than having uh, the ability to connect a number of different dots, right? And as we progress in our career and become more experienced, we get very good at that one dot. We might be a great marketer or a social content creator or a supply chain executive, uh, but we, we fail to recognize some of these other dots that are out there that we can start to create pattern recognition and come up with ideas. So even here at Platypus Labs, each month we go and explore a number of different businesses. It could be big or small. And we, we look at their customer experience, we sign up for their emails, we buy their product or services if possible. Sometimes we might call investor relations and try to learn a little bit more about that company. And if you do that on a systematic, regular basis, you have all these insights that you can draw upon when you're faced with a challenge or opportunity. So the borrowed idea is one of my favorites. It, it does take time, but just a couple of sequences into it by exploring very unique business models, you can find some really incredible ideas to, again, apply to your business. I, I love that. I think especially it's so easy sometimes to get so obsessed with your own processes and, and trying to optimize them as, as uh, finally as possible that you sometimes lose the side of the, the wood for the trees or whatever, the, the trees for the wood, whatever the, uh, the famous That's phrase. That's right. 
Yeah, I mean, a great example, the one that we like to share with many of our clients is Idea Bank. It's a bank in Poland, and they came across an insight that up to 80% of their small business customers didn't have time to get to the bank during the day, right? And so what ended up happening was they were going to the ATMs at night. And not only was that a burden on their time, it was also a concern for their safety. And if you think about it, the rules, if you will, of an ATM are pretty straightforward. They're in a stationary location, like at a bank or a public location, but the team at the Idea Bank, they actually saw all the success that the on-demand services were having. You, today, you can have almost anything you want delivered to you. Um, and they created these cars that had built-in ATMs. And users would go in and order the car. You're notified when it's outside your door. You go out and transact your business and off the car goes, right? So if you're in Poland, what bank are you going to choose? And what we love about that idea is that they didn't get it by studying other banks and looking at the geographic distribution of where other ATMs are and where can, they can create more convenience. They went totally outside of their industry to find this idea and bring it back and create this very elegant solution. Absolutely. Uh, Kaiser, we've been talking a lot about uh, being inspired and getting ideas and facilitating idea generation, but as you and I know, ideas are only as valuable as the air they're uh, sort of spoken with. What, what have you found and what do you maybe refer to in the book as far as actually executing and delivering on these ideas? How, how can companies become better at that? Yeah, I think that's, that's the thing. You know, oftentimes we do work with organizations that they, they're challenged with the fact that they have hundreds of ideas, but they get become paralyzed with what do we do next? Uh, so for us, we, we do take many of our clients through a very systematic approach to prioritize the ideas based on a number of different criteria. But for us, probably the biggest thing that when, when we work with large organization is this, this, this mindset of rapid experimentation. Uh, oftentimes we see organizations become paralyzed by you know, the, the process that they have to go through, the overzealous planning, the need to have extensive ROI, writing a three or five year business plan, and, and, and therefore these ideas don't necessarily move forward. Instead, we try to teach organizations to build this culture of just constantly testing and iterating and learning. And I, I know that's in our world of creative problem solvers, you know, that's, that's a very common mindset, but we do find in larger organizations that they, they just don't have the right tools or the infrastructure to support that culture of rapid experimentation. And when we can show organizations how to do that, how to get some customer feedback, how to validate the ideas and how to identify the most promising ones to push forward, that's where we see a lot of those ideas start to push through the process closer towards implementation. But there, there is kind of that bottleneck right there that, yeah, we had this great ideation session. We came up with hundreds of ideas, but oh shoot, what do we do next? And that's where uh, we try to break some of the you know, very systematic corporate processes that can take a long time and show teams and leaders how they can test and move things a lot quicker through their innovation pipeline. I think it all comes back to permission. Uh, and often there's, especially from the, the upper levels of management, there's a, a desire to support these ideas. They might even give the, the resources available uh, to, to, to do sprints or uh, MVPs or uh, yeah. ventures, whatever they might be. And then somewhere in the middle management, someone doesn't have the permission to, uh, to give something free because up until now, all the templates that they need to fill out were in a specific format. And you said it's the three-year, five-year business plan until everyone in that authority ladder uh, That's right. is on board. It's going to be very hard for everything to go through if one rung of that ladder can say no someone's going to say no yeah that's true i mean i think permission is uh one big part of that equation the the other side is we see that many teams and organizations wait for instruction right wait for the senior leaders to say okay this is what you do and one of the mindsets that i write about in my book is called compasses over maps and and we see that some of the best innovators out there use more of a compass to guide their overall direction of where they're trying to take the innovation rather than waiting for a detailed map on how to get there. And they trust their instinct to course correct and identify uh, what they need to figure out along the way. They're a little bit more comfortable with that ambiguity of you know, what's to come next and is this the right idea, but they get 
in front of the innovation process through that experimentation methodology to test and validate and iterate and continue to go through that cycle. So I think part of it is for sure uh, making sure that you have the right environment where there is permission to try new things and extend a little bit of uh, leeway to your organization to experiment. Uh, but the other side is, you know, this, this mindset of really just kind of getting started before you're ready and not waiting for permission, not waiting for detailed instructions and using more of a compass to guide your innovation process rather than a detailed map on how to get there. I love that. I'm, uh, I'm probably going to turn that into a, an article right now. I love that compass, not maps uh, idiom. Um, Kaiser, it's been wonderful speaking with you. If people want to find out more about you, your book, the work that you do, uh, what's the best place they can go to find out more? Yeah, well, thank you very much for the opportunity to uh, talk about that. So our, our my company's website is platypuslabs.com. You can find some more information about our organization and some of the things that we do there. Uh, the book specifically, we have a website called crack-the-innovation-code.com, uh, where you can learn more about the book. Um, and there's also an assessment on that website where you can take the assessment to see if the book will help you. It's more of a creativity and innovation assessment. And I know a lot of our readers have had a lot of benefit to take that assessment and identify some of their creativity gaps and understand some of the skill sets and mindsets that they need to work on to, again, help unlock and build their creative potential. So platypuslabs.com and cracktheinnovationcode.com. Perfect. I'll make sure to get those links down in the description below. Kaiser, it's been wonderful speaking with you, and I look forward to speaking again with you soon. Great, Nick. Thank you very much. It was a pleasure being here. Thank you so much for listening. If you liked it, please like, share, and subscribe, and leave me a comment about what you thought and what you'd like to see more about. If you want to take your creativity and innovation capabilities to the next level, then invest in yourself with the premium training only available at ideatovalue.com. These exclusive training modules have all been put together by me, Nick Skillicorn, and have been used by thousands of artists, innovation leaders, and CEOs to become better at understanding the source of their creativity and executing on their innovation ambitions. And there is no risk to new you, as they are backed by our money-back guarantee. Now, don't forget to go out there and make your ideas a reality. See you again soon.